the Institute for the Study of Peak States presents the second International Psychoimmunology and Psychobiology Research Symposium. Using peak state therapy as schema therapy intervention. Presented by Dr. Daniel Zeiss. Okay. So for our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Daniel Zeiss started his career as a medical director, uh, sorry, a medical doctor uh, with a specialization in occupational medicine, medical informatics, and nutrition. He has worked for 10 years in the international reinsurance and health insurance business, managed global projects, and head of the Department for Health Management. He now works as a medical doctor in a psychiatric hospital, personal development coach, health researcher, and speaker. He thrives on helping people resolving problems they may have been struggling with their whole life. So, Daniel, over to you. Yes. Hey, Shane. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, I'll just start sharing my slides. Okay. As a certified therapist for the Institute for the Study of Peak States, I'm familiar with good techniques to help clients release emotional pain and help them attain enhanced states of consciousness. As a medical doctor, I rely on knowledge, experience and studies to have diagnosing tools and treatments, treatment options for my patients. Sometimes we do not have studies for exactly what we are looking for, so we need to take the next best evidence available. For example, peak stage therapy, I know it works, my client knows it works, and uh, many of you also know it works. But some people might not be convinced since there, since there are not so many studies, official studies with peak states yet available. Peak states Therapy uses mostly EFT-based tapping techniques, um, and there are a lot of studies showing that EFT actually works with many emotional problems. This is good reason for me to pursue and explore this field and um, also share my latest project with you. In this presentation, I would like to talk to you about schema therapy and peak states therapy. Schema therapy, um, we'll talk about two models inside of schema therapy, which is the schema model and the mold model. And we talk about peak states therapy and the proposed study. One day I sat in the cognitive behavioral therapy training and the presenter explained the different waves of development this therapy went through. We are currently in the third wave in the latest uh, wave of, of uh, behavioral therapy and um, and that's the wave where emotional based therapy techniques were introduced and something called schema therapy. In peak states therapy, we often meet clients who wish to resolve their dysfunctional behavioral patterns. We usually use trauma resolving techniques for that. So patterns or schemas caught my attention. It even got more interesting when the presenter explained one of the intervention methods of schema therapy called imaginary rescripting. This technique uses something similar as we use in peak states whole heart healing. It uses somatizing of the emotion and regression. This cut me hooked and I started to explore schema therapy further. So I learned about um, schema therapy that was pretty recently created and already gained acceptance in the professional mental health community. It uses different elements from many already available therapies, um, like Gestalt therapy. I learned that it was created to help borderline patients. I learned that it identifies 18 common schemas or patterns, which to a certain degree everybody has. Um, I learned about the believed origin of these schemas, which are frustrated core emotional needs. Um, and I learned about how we can change the behavior by cognitive and emotional work. And I finally learned how a healthy adult would react and how we can strengthen such a healthy adult. So following the pattern or the schema of schema therapy itself, I thought 
How about adding another therapy to the list of therapies that schema therapy already incorporated? Since peak states theory and the therapy are a fantastic way for me to help my clients, patients and myself, it might just fit right in with schema therapy. It could make it much faster, adding more value and making the results even more sustainable and long lasting. It could give schema therapy a deeper understanding of what actually happens at the interface between psyche and biology, and it even might help peak states to diagnose more and deeper. Now I would like to introduce you to the schema model of schema therapy. So as I mentioned before, in schema therapy, um, the focus is on the core emotional needs of a born child of an adolescent. Schema therapy identifies five emotional, core emotional needs. The first one is secure attachment to others, which includes safety, stability, nurturance and acceptance. In short, we call that attachment. The second one is autonomy, competence and sense of identity. The third one is realistic limits and self-control. The fourth one, freedom to express valid needs and emotions. And the fifth one is spontaneity and play. These are the core emotional needs every human being has and which are fulfilled or not fulfilled or frustrated during the first months and years of our lives. Um, schema therapy also uses a term to determine why certain people react differently to the same stimulus. And that's called emotional temperament. Um, it's defined as a unique and distinct personality um, or temperament from birth on. Some children are irritable to the same stimulus, some react shy, or some might even react aggressive. Um, in schema therapy, it's called that it's genetic. We already heard about epigenetics, so that's I'm just presenting the schema therapy and everything you learned before and heard before. That's something we want to integrate here. Um, it's the biological underpinnings, the genetic, and it's said to be relatively unchangeable even through psychotherapy. And depending on the emotional temperament, the child reacts to stimulus in a certain way and might form schemas. So what is a schema or what is an early maladaptive schema? A schema is a broad pervasive theme or pattern that is usually developed during childhood or adolescence or young adolescence. And it's comprised out of memories, emotions, cognitions and bodily sensations. And it has to do with oneself and one's relationship with others. We'll go now into depth into these schemas. But first we discuss a little bit on how a schema develops. So I mentioned already the five core emotional needs everybody has. If one or more of these core emotional needs are not met, then depending on the emotional temperament of the child, um, the child reacts to that situation and might indirectly fulfill that frustrational need or might alternatively fulfill another core emotional need. And with that fulfillment, there's a certain gain. So there's a behavior and there's a certain gain. There's a certain reward to that behavior. And there's also some learning involved. And uh, more neurobiologically, we, they're trained attractors and it's their neurological pathways set up. So schemers, once learned in young childhood, are very, very difficult to change. So they're resistant to change. On the one hand, for example, if we learn to walk, that is very beneficial. So we might even be able to walk even if we had a few drinks too much. Um, our body still knows how to do it, more or less. Um, but if there's a schema involved, which makes our life difficult, so wanting to change it makes it difficult. So as an example, um, let me take you through Laura. Uh, and Laura is uh, 32 years old. And as a child, she witnessed um, repeatedly that her mother, her depressive mother, abruptly packed a suitcase, a small suitcase, and 
announced that she was going to leave the family now forever. Laura, in that case, as a young child, as a young girl, developed a schema called abandonment and instability because she felt abandoned. Of course, there were other schemas as well, but that was the one, the predominant schema that formed. And that was activated basically when Laura later noticed when she was an adult um, that nobody has actively inquired about her for a while. She then felt painfully lonely. Usually in that example, Laura begins a series of short erotic escapades, scornfully leaving the man the next morning. This made her feel good. The feeling good came because of the core emotional needs of autonomy and control and self-esteem enhancement were met. Due to periodically pronounced consumption of addictive substances, so core emotional need of avoidance of unwanted behavior, so she drank or uh, consumed to feel better, she came to the clinic where she seeked help from a therapist but she was very dependent and in a very close relationship with that therapist because she still had that core emotional need of attachment not fulfilled in her childhood. So um, that continued. And when she, um, yeah, when she had end to end the therapy because she was using drug while she was an inpatient, she berates the therapist violently and in tears for never having been there for her properly. So in her perspective, from her perspective, the therapist did the mistake, and that was her reaction, that she was very, very upset about that. And that is the schema. So why do we go through all this and define schemas? It's good to have some knowledge and a label to talk with the patient, with the client about the behavior and basically name something. It helps the client to understand the biographical origins. So, for example, in case of Laura, when we are in therapy with Laura, Laura, we can talk with her about her past, we can talk about with her about her mother. And then if there's the scheme of uh, um, abandonment, she can basically understand better why she behaves in a certain way. And just by knowing about it and accepting that there is uh, is a schema, things behavior already slowly changes and the resolving starts. So here is an example um, for a certain schema. So we have five core emotional needs. And um, when one core emotional need is uh, frustrated, then there are several possible schemas that can be formed. I'm not going through all of the 18 schemas here, but just as an example, we take the domain one, the attachment uh, related schemas. So when the, when attachment is frustrated, the need for attachment is frustrated, then we have uh, some something a feeling of disconnected of rejection. And depending on the um, emotional temperament, a schema of abandonment, a schema of mistrust of, and abuse, of emotional deprivation, of feeling defectiveness, uh, defective, the defectiveness or shame schema, uh, or the social isolation schema can, can be formed. The interesting thing is that these schemas, because they are formed so early in development, are mostly subconscious. They are automatic. Yeah. So example of Laura, that is very automatic what she does when she feels lonely and she not really thinks about it. There's just the urge for her to do a certain thing and they're imperative. And because they're so deep down um, engraved into our being, um, it's very difficult to change through cognition alone. Um, we have certain strategies to walk around painful uh, situations and the big categories are surrender, avoidance and overcompensations. Um, the interesting thing is we not only have these uh, categories of um, coping, but we also have the possibility to form other schemas to cope with schemas. So especially the schemas in the fourth and fifth domain um, are strategies to cope with schemas in the first and third domain, uh, first to the third domain. That means we call the schemas in the one, two and third domain unconditional schemas. 
and there are schemas like abandonment, mistrust, emotional deprivation, effectiveness, social isolation, dependence, vulnerability, enmeshment, failure, negativity, punitiveness, entitlement, and insufficient self-control. And then we have conditional schemas from the fourth and fifth domain, which are subjugation, self-sacrifice, approval seeking, emotional inhibition, and unrelenting standards. So these conditional schemas can be used as secondary schemas to get relief. Here are some examples for that. For example, the schema of unrelenting standards can be formed in response to the schema of defectiveness. So the individual might believe, if I can be perfect, then I will be worthy of love. Or another example would be the schema of subjugation in response to a schema of abandonment. The individual then believes, if I do whatever the other person wants and never get angry about it, then the other person will stay with me. Or a schema of self-sacrifice in response to a schema of defectiveness. If I meet all of this individual needs and ignore my own, then the individual will accept me despite my flaws and will not feel so unlovable. Obviously, if one believes these things and lives its life, uh, his or her life after these uh, beliefs, then um, life can be very difficult. And so this leads us to the question of when is a schema a problem or dysfunctional and when is a schema okay and helpful? So as I said before, everybody, everybody of us has gone through childhood and has developed certain schemas to live our lives. And um, sometimes these schemas um, are unpleasant, so we have coping mechanisms. And if these coping mechanisms stay the same from childhood to adulthood, then we talk about dysfunctional. Why is that? Because usually as an adult, we have a more complex world which we, um, which we encounter. And also um, for that more complex world, we have bigger, many more resources. Let's take, for example, a, 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 a patient who has a schema of vulnerability and uh, perhaps attachment. And um, as a child, this person might have hurt the boy, that boy might have hurt himself and then started to cry. And then he would get attention from mommy or from the teacher. And then the core emotional need of um, attachment would be fulfilled. So this person learned that um, it's okay. It, crying is helpful and now imagine that boy now being 50 years old for the first time now after 20 45 years hurting himself and he started to cry and his work colleagues or his boss sees that then there might be a problem in the interaction and, uh, and relationship between all of them so as you can see if we have we all have schemas but um, the dysfunctional ones are usually when we, when we use coping techniques from our childhood. And I find that very interesting because in peak states, we also know that um, we have trine brains and these trine brains are said to be also at the age of five or six or seven, depending on trauma, stopping their personal growth or their, their brain growth. And so there might be a similarity between what schema therapy describes and what we know from the ISPS peak states theory. Now let's go to the mode model. While what I explained before in the schema model is very cognitive, it's very theoretical, it's very um, yeah, heavy, you have to think about that very much. The mode model is the, con uh, the contrast. It's, um, it's an effective state, it's temporary, and it describes the current situation a client is in. So there might be, the client might be emotional and they might, might have the original emotion from that incident that happened when he, was, he or she was a child. Um, it might be a coping emotion to a schema or it might be even activated schema that a, that a patient describes or a client describes even in one sentence. So the sentence can have certain aspects of it. This is actually the basis for schema therapy. So everything in the schema model, I, what I explained before is the theoretical background and in the schema therapy actually we work with that mode model um, describing the functional states and, um, and it's very experience oriented. So the patient just explains what he or she experienced, how he felt about it or she felt about it and 
and um, and then we write the mode uh, we, we write down the mode model and we ha usually have four boxes there we the healthy adult mode is actually the desired mode so the healthy adult is a mode where we talk about cooperation where you talk about self-care and self-expression and then we have the child modes usually the child expresses hurt feelings okay or frustrated core emotional needs then we might have the inner critic or the critical parent mode where we have internalized representation of others. So that might be the teacher telling you that you're not going to succeed in life if you're going to be that lazy. And you, have, you always have that thought and that some might be some motivator you have for doing good work. And then we have maladaptive coping modes. As we already have said, there's uh, three categories, surrender, avoidance, and overcompensations. And this, these, these maladaptive coping modes basically create our clinical symptoms. Now here's a little bit more detail. So um, in the child modes, we might have a vulnerable child. We might have an angry, enraged, impulsive, undisciplined, a happy child. And the inner critic modes, we might have a punitive critic or a demanding critic. And in the maladaptive coping modes, we might have a compliant surrenderer. Basically, that is the victim, okay? Oh, the world is so difficult and I can't do anything in the world. That might be a compliant surrenderer. A detached protector, it's some, somebody who takes himself out of the equation, basically just observes, there's no emotion. And with that detachment, he or she protects himself from emotions. Um, a detached self-suitor, these are usually coping modes for people who or describing people who, who are looking very much for relax and then for spa day and are taking overly uh, care for themselves, or even on the other side, um, taking sugar, alcohol, drugs to get some positive feelings and stimulus. We have somebody who might present themselves bigger as they are, as for overcompensation, or even as a bully and attack, bullying somebody and attacking somebody um, to not feel the emotion. The interesting thing is the punitive critic and the demanding critic, they sound very familiar in the descriptions and also when you listen to, to psychotherapy clients, uh, um, like the ribosomal voices we know from peak states theory. Um, I'm not sure if they're 100% the same, but they sound very similar. And um, the vulnerable child modes or the child modes itself, they sound a little bit like biographical or generational trauma. These are some books about the schema therapy. There are plenty, plenty of more, but these are some of the main books. And um, now let's go to peak states therapy. I'll just go briefly through it because we had all these beautiful talks and before now in the morning um, about how peak states therapy was set out to understand spiritual, shamanic and transpersonal experiences, how it developed trauma healing techniques, how it discovered peak states of consciousness, how it discovered the, that the origin of trauma is re relevant. It can be neonatal, but it can also be prenatal. Uh, Celine did a wonderful talk about that. Here you have a picture of this trauma string. Um, and then Grant went into more details about subcellular psychobiology and the psychoimmunology and the latest developments. And, um, and this is beautiful therapy and beautiful uh, beautiful work and research and the yeah the main model right now or the primary cell to understand the connection between consciousness and biology and the developmental events where we know that at certain stages in the development certain traumas can block um, peak states we already had the books so i'm skipping over this so the proposed study so what do we do with all of these schema therapy and peak states? Um, currently, the schema therapy model looks like this. It uh, has the model, the schemas and the modes. We talked about them. And then it has this emotional temperament like a black box. Nobody knows about it. It's just genetic and we just, yeah, we just close that off. Then we have certain tools, for example, as questionnaires or the mode model. And, um, and then we have um, flashcards, for example. And then we have um, interventions and these interventions can be um, cognitive interventions where we explain the patient the theory um, the model it's transparent fully explained so the patient understands what we're talking about 
we actually go ahead and analyze the patient's current situation with that mode model, write it down, develop it together, um, and give some psychoeducation information. We use in schema therapy behavioral interventions. Basically, the entire behavioral therapy repertoire is used to change dysfunctional behavior um, by repetition, by reconditioning, and giving homework and writing journals and so on. Um, and then very new with the third wave in schema therapy, the emotional activating interventions. And there, the chair work, where we basically have several chairs in the room and we say to the client, okay, this is the chair for the child, this is the chair for the inner critic, this is the chair for the mode, and this is the chair for the healthy, um, uh, healthy adult. And so the client presents his or her problem and then the therapist directs the client to sit in which chair so the client understands and really feels um, it's a little bit like constellation work also it's it feels how how really in the child chair he might sit like small and, and might even start to cry while in the inner critic chair he comes up and, and sits straight and then says no you don't have to be lazy and, and, and so on so it's it's beautiful to see how client develops in this chair um, work and, and, and they also understand much better what happens with them in their situation and with a goal, with the objective to strengthen that, um, that healthy adult. And then the uh, imaginary and rescripting um, intervention where we actually have this regression as we do in wholehearted healing and um, go to an event and then change something. There are many books and, and, and descriptions on how to do it in, in schema therapy. And, um, but from the trauma healing aspect, uh, aspect, we know a little bit more. And this is actually what I would like to propose and what I like to do with the study to introduce the peak states model into, into the uh, schema therapy to enhance that model so that we not only talk about the black box about the emotional temperament, but that we know that there's something, there's a primary cell and there's certain interactions. So we know about the interface between the psyche and the uh, biology and into in the interventions that we put our peak states tools there to um, help um, help the um, um, the client get better faster so what could be these tools um, of course the primary cell model i already said that but there could be like the generational healing um, technique sometimes in, in in therapy i discovered that there are for example e-holds with the clients and so certain certain modes are triggered because there's an e-hold there can be body associations there can be projections many times it's uh, it's uh, there are projections from the child um core issues can be there we could use the silent mind process to get rid of uh, the the ribosomal voices and perhaps dim down the inner critic a little bit the inner peace of course to make everything more peaceful and that's beautiful for depression patients. And lastly, um, this, this concept of frustration of core emotional needs. In, in the last weeks, I, 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 I was uh, looking into that a little bit and it looks like that this has something to do with the COA holes. And um, I'm not completely sure what and, and there needs to be some more investigating in that but there's something with the frustration, not having a trauma, an injury, but missing something, the missing, the neglect, there might be something with the COA holes. And of course, Georg's technique, which was presented last year in last year's symposium, might also help with these uh, frustrated emotional, core emotional needs. So what to expect in the study? Um, it's not completely clear how the study is going to be formed. That depends on, on many factors. Um, of course, there need to be inclusion and exclusion criteria. We need to have some questionnaires at the beginning of the treatment, so a before status. Um, we've got to re re randomize the, um, the participants into a peak states group and a schema therapy intervention group. Um, there has to be a certain number of um, sessions, so usual uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy last 60 sessions so that's a little bit the concept is different and uh, then with the peak states where we have the pay for result uh, concept and then at the end um, there needs to be uh, another question to see what has changed so the next steps is to going to be to write everything down find an ethics committee to to approve what what we are going to do 
find and secure funding. So that's an ongoing topic, as you might have heard in the other talks as well. Um, then the recruiting, as I said, there might be people um, that need to, uh, to, to, to have that work done, but they might not be the first that uh, have to be included in the study. So we might also start with some healthy and some, then some um, people who have actually some conditions. And that, that's something some to work out and then to start. So when you are interested uh, or if you're interested in that study and if you want to participate and want to stay in contact and want to resolve your non-functional dysfunctional schemas, just uh, take your phone, scan that QR code and uh, well, leave your information in the form. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And now I'm uh, happy to uh, answer some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. At the moment, there's no questions. I've got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed. That's the first presentation that uh, one of us has done that's got a QR code at the end of the, the presentation. That's very high technology. Well done. <laughs> ah, well, thank you. <laughs> well, when, when they're la later there are questions, I'm happy to uh, look into the QA and uh, yes. uh, answer them in the text. That'll be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much, you. Daniel. Thank you for watching. For more information, visit danieljais.com.